Hello, my name is Jane Dinsmore and I'm the program director for uh, PERCOM Online Inc., uh, which is a DBA, a professional education and resources company. Uh, we're also known as PERCOM Kilgore College Consortium for our paramedic program. And I'd like to welcome you to the uh, P1, um, which is the first part of our paramedic class, uh, and or the AEMT class, if that's what you would like uh, to do. This class is designed in such a way that it has the first part of the paramedic program front-loaded for all of the advanced EMT, NREMT advanced um, required content that is uh, public was published in 2009-2010 uh, so that folks that want to test at that level can. Folks that wanted to uh, that were already intermediates or AMTs who wanted to come into a paramedic program and get some credit for that have the opportunity to challenge uh, portions of the course. Uh, that way it makes it a little more palatable when you might can get some credit for what you've already done rather than redoing it all. Um, so whatever the case that you're in this course, we'd like to welcome you. Uh, the purpose of this video is to basically give you an oversight of uh, chain of command who's responsible for what for the most part and who's in charge and then to kind of go through some of the introduction materials to make sure that the things that you're reading make sense that you have read things and that you understand how the course works which will minimize um, problems issues questions etc I should hope so let's start with with me as I said I'm the program director which means I'm in charge overall for all of the academic or educational content. Uh, myself and Dr. George Kiss and uh, coordinators um, make sure that the content that's offered meets or exceeds the national standards. And, but I'm ultimately in charge. I am the one who's in charge over the faculty, and the faculty being the teaching staff, whether it's the folks who um, are teaching the didactic portion, uh, teaching skills, the clinical sections, etc., they all answer to me ultimately. Um, I am responsible for scheduling skills sessions and making sure that you're locked into those sessions when it's time for you to RSVP. Uh, so you'll be dealing with me at that point. And then I coordinate that between you and the site or instructors. And then when it's over, then I'm the one that handles making sure all of your paperwork is in, uh, that your competency worksheets are, are done and back out or those type of things. I do maintain general oversight of the clinical and field rotations, but it's general oversight. I have Mr. Donald Reuter. He's a certified uh, coordinator who is considered our clinical coordinator. Um, David Allman works with him to assist him in handling all of the clinical and field site issues. They handle this. I don't get involved unless there's a problem. When the all the clinical and field requirements are met, then that comes back up for my review and eventually for Dr. Kiss's review. Dr. George Kiss is the medical director for the program. And then we approve the final product. Um, but I do main, maintain general oversight of all of those things. I'm the one who handles dealing with the state, um, national accrediting folks, etc. This doesn't mean that I should be copied on all the emails between you and your lead instructor, you and the clinical staff, etc. Uh, I get literally hundreds of emails a day. And if I even have to stop and read an email to determine that it shouldn't, I shouldn't have been included in the thread, it's not in my issue right now, then it takes time away from dealing with real problems that others may have. So the only time you should be emailing me is if there's a problem that has not been resolved by the appropriate people in a reasonable manner, and we'll discuss that, um, or uh, to RSVP for skills, ask questions about skill sessions, or carry on conversations about skill sessions. And then at the end of the course, I coordinate getting your paperwork from my secretary on out and back in, and I'm the one who ultimately will mark you clear for your national certification exams, and uh, I'm the one who will also be the one to sign your course completion certificate and we'll discuss all of that later. Coming back quickly to the structure of the course, if you are in the paramedic course, the total paramedic course, you are required to complete all of P1. You are not required to test AEMT 
with the National Registry. You only can have to do that if you want to, and then you have to let me know that. Uh, typically, at your first practice session, there will be a place for you to check on the bottom of the form to let me know if you're planning on testing at AEMT as well as paramedic, or if you're just going to wait to test till paramedic, or for those of you who are in just in AEMT, you'd mark just AEMT at the bottom of the form. That way I know who's doing what. And you may have to remind me too whenever you finish the um, P1 components if you're planning on testing AEMT so I can make sure you get processed. All right. Now, moving along about the structure of the course and the paperwork. Uh, when you enrolled, you received a welcome packet that you had to fill out a lot of different information, sign forms, etc., and send back to become enrolled or you wouldn't be seeing this video. That welcome packet contains important information that each student must read and refer to as needed. So hopefully you read it all before you signed everything. But if you did not, or if you just skimmed through it, um, you need to read that now. And even if you read it, it's always a good idea to print every bit of this off, keep it in a notebook for future reference so that you can refer back. All right. The, one of the important documents in that welcome packet was the student handbook. The student handbook is the policy and procedure manual for the program for your course. So you need to read it all and be familiar with its contents because those are the rules that govern the majority of the things for the course that you have to adhere to. You'll get a clinical manual when you start rotations, which has more rules that are specific to clinical and field rotations, but this is the primary policy and procedure manual. Print it off, read it, refer to it when you need to. Know what's in it. Uh, there's an infection control manual in that packet. The infection control manual is dry material, but it's important material and I recommend highly that you read it and study it. It talks about the most common diseases, disease processes, uh, the way those diseases spread, and how to protect yourself in the healthcare industry. Um, you really don't want to risk getting coming in contact with something unnecessarily when you could have protected yourself and maybe becoming sick now, a year from now, five years from now, ten years from now, and it could have been avoided. And you certainly don't want to risk becoming contaminated with something and taking it home to your loved ones and infecting them. So I highly recommend that you study that manual and be familiar with that material which backs up material that is in your course. Um, there are contracts and releases inside that packet as well. Go back and read them all so that you know what you signed and what your responsibilities are. When you finished the enrollment process, you received a course welcome email, and that is another important document with an important attachment that I recommend highly that you print off and keep in a notebook. Um, in that course access email, it gave you the name of your lead instructor for didactic as well as that person's email address. That person then should have, within a few days after you getting your course access email, sent you a welcome email as well to make sure that everything's working correctly between the two of you. If you did not receive a course email from your lead instructor after the course access email, and you're watching this video, then I recommend highly you check your spam folder, junk folder, trash folders in your email because sometimes that's where they go when they don't recognize the user or the sender, especially with Yahoo, uh, Gmail, and AOL. Those are difficult ISPs, uh, and please be sure and check there. If you have a military address that you gave during registration, you need to email me a new address, Hotmail, Yahoo, preferably Hotmail, Yahoo is difficult, um, but another email address that is not military because PERCOM cannot email you at a military address. It won't bounce back and it never gets to you. So please be sure you do that. Um, and if you've not received an email and, you're, and it's not in your spam, junk, trash folders, then email your instructor saying, hey, I didn't hear from you, I want to make sure our email between us is working properly and give him a reasonable or her a reasonable amount of time to answer you within a week and if not then try again and let me know but that you a lot of times with email ISPs if you email and then they hit reply back then your email ISP recognizes so those are ways to troubleshoot that um, 
You also had that attachment that we're going to discuss, but in that attachment is a lot of very important information about the course, about what's expected, and about the student announcements page and how to get there. And we'll discuss that in a few moments. Please read it thoroughly. Uh, grades are posted inside the gradebook inside this course. The most of your research exams are auto graded. If they were multiple choice going through, then it auto grades. It came up and should have showed you a, a grade and what you did right, what you did wrong. And then there's a grade book inside the course uh, where it posts that. Hand graded uh, items shouldn't take more than a couple of weeks to get back an email telling you what you did right, what you did wrong, a grade, and they are manually entered by the instructors in the grade book. However, due to the nature of the content of your course and the fact that we don't just want to enter grades, we want to ensure that you're grasping and understanding the content, do not be surprised if your instructor emails you back and wants you to redo portions or all of an assignment and gives you instructions for what he or she is looking for. Because we want to ensure that if you show up on a call to our house, to us or our loved ones that we know you understood and you're knowledgeable and capable. So don't get your feelings hurt if they send it back. Read what they have to say, do some more research and redo and resubmit the assignment. Things will be fine and then wait for them to grade it. Um, if you don't hear anything back in two weeks, email them again saying, hey, I want to make sure you got my assignment because I've never heard back. Internet heaven is a real place. It's much more dependable than the United States Postal Service and probably other countries' postal services, but some things still go to Internet Heaven. They never get to their intended recipients. Very small percentage. Sometimes maybe there was a typo in the way you entered the email address. Sometimes it just never gets there. So follow up after about two weeks with another email and making sure that they got your assignment. And that will prompt them to, and to look for it. Maybe it got buried. I've had some get buried in... Uh, emails get buried in my inbox because the sender's date and time stamp that their computer is set for was for a date and time further back so I never knew it came in. This can happen too so be sure you check and make sure your computer's date and time stamp is, is set for the appropriate date and time that it'll marry up those emails and get them to their intended destinations where people can see them or at least ensure it uh, more than not having that. Okay, about grades, you must maintain an 80 average to remain in this course. You'll get one chance if you drop below an 80 average, you'll receive an academic probation form with instructions on how to bring your grade up, what is expected, when, and you have to sign and return that form by the deadline the instructor gives you or you'll be dropped as a fail from the course. So don't neglect it, do it. And then follow the instructions. You only get one chance to drop below 80. And really, in this course, there's no reason for you to drop below an 80. All of your work, until you get to final exam in this course, is open book, open internet, non-timed. So there's plenty of time for you to research the material. That's why we call them research exams. They're not based on just any one textbook. There are material that may come out of the lecture presentations that we've posted, out of the book you have, out of another textbook, off, off the internet from valid sources, the American Heart Association, um, the pre-hospital trauma life support folks. could be any number of places, just like the national certification exam does. So if it's not in your book or the answers don't seem to marry up with what's in your book, you need to do some more research and expect questions that maybe are not covered yet. You're being given the opportunity to research and start learning. That's part of the style that we use here, and it is very, very effective. Our pass rates on the national certification exams are very high, and the people that come out of our courses usually do very, very well in their careers. So use your time. Spend time on the assignments while maintaining your course deadline. Uh, and speaking of which, I did forget to tell you, in your uh, course access email was listed your course deadline. For P1, you have nine months to complete everything. And when I say everything, that's not just the didactic content of the course. That's the didactic content, the P1 skill sessions, and final exam. And if you are planning on testing National Registry Advanced, AEMT, then you also will have to complete a minimum of 168 hours of clinical and field rotations in that time. 
I say a minimum because there are also certain contacts and skills that you have to succeed in getting. And if you don't, you have to pull some more hours. But that nine-month window that you get for P1, you have to complete everything. If you are going all the way through paramedic and not planning on testing at AEMT, that 168 hours doesn't have to be completed before you finish P1. <clears throat> you can start rotations so that you can start getting them under your belt, but you don't have to complete all 168 hours minimum and contacts and such before you enter P2. You usually have to complete everything else within that nine-month window. You can complete faster if you choose. It's up to you. All right. Um, final exams, you must make a 70 on the final exam. It is mostly scenario-based, which means that you need to do your own work in this course. It is okay to have sessions with other students to discuss material. It's okay to discuss material to a degree in the, the forums and the, the Yahoo list that we have set up for your class. But don't ask for specific answers to specific questions and then not learn it and go on. Don't take someone else's work and use that to answer your questions. If you do not learn the material, you will most likely not pass our final exam and you will most likely not pass the national exam. So it does not benefit you to split up the assignments and have this person do that part and this person do that part and copy it in. It's not going to help you any. You have to do the work to learn. If you fail final exam, then you're allowed to retest. I recommend you take a minimum of a week to 10 days to study before you schedule your retest. There is a retest fee and you have to pay that before you can schedule. You have one um, exam, final exam built into your course tuition. The reason for that is, is that we do them one-on-one -on -one proctored by webinar, which means a, a member of our staff has to take that time, that two and a half hours out of their schedule and proctor an exam for you, one-on-one. -on -one. And we have hundreds of students. So if you fail it, then you have to pay for that person's time to come back and retest it. We include the one. And you have to make an 80 to pass the retest on a different exam. If you fail it a second time, by policy in your student handbook, the only way that you can take the exam again is to find a state or nationally certified EMS instructor, email and have that person email that information to me so I can verify it and I have to improve that person. And then they need to tutor you on content, things that you're weak on, identify areas you're weak on and help you as well as test taking and reading skills. And it's at your expense. We don't provide the tutors. So if you don't know anyone who meets that, I do also and will send you information for a very good tutor that we have located who does this for a living and has very good results. But again, the tutoring expenses on yourself. So again, it benefits you to pass the exam the first time, which means you need to learn your material. Um, once tutoring is done, your tutor will be required to email me and release you and say that you're as ready as you're going to be. You pay another retest fee. And then you may be scheduled to take the third and final test, which is a different test again. And you must make an 80. If you fail at that time, unfortunately, you fail the course. Okay? You do not have to have taken and passed final exam at this level to start your skill sessions. You only have to be through the pharmacology portion of the course. All of the reading, all of the assignments, everything, and your instructor mark you clear to start skills. And then when you start skills, if you do well at your first session, they'll clear you to start your rotations. But you don't have to wait till after final exam to start skills. We'll talk about skills later. One of the other ways that you're graded in our program is known as affective behavior. Affective behavior basically is knowledge, not just knowledge, but professional knowledge, the way you carry yourself, the way you interact with others, your professional bearing, your behavior. Um, in other words, a bad example of of behavior would be lying, cheating, stealing, plagiarism, um, sexual harassment, um, other things that could be just as serious. Um, some things are more serious than others uh, and could lead you to being expelled from the program. For instance, plagiarism is not tolerated. What is plagiarism? Plagiarism is copying from your fellow students to get your answers, copying their work. Plagiarism is 
copying and pasting from a website, typing up exactly what it says in a book. You can go to these places, but you need to put what you're finding in your own words. When you copy and paste or just type what is written, you're not learning, and it's plagiarism, and it's against the law, and it's against PERCOM policy. We do not tolerate plagiarism, and trust me, we run your assignments through plagiarism checkers. So if you're caught plagiarizing, you stand to you risk being expelled from the program. Um, like I said, lying, cheating, stealing from clinical sites, um, sexual harassment, especially uh, physical se sexual harassment. Um, there are other things that are, could be considered serious enough to be expelled without a warning. But most things, you'd get a, a counseling statement telling what what happened, what behavior is expected of you as a professional, what you have to do to improve, and then you would have to get subsequent affective behavior evaluations from other instructors, from that instructor, from myself, etc., before you can graduate the program verifying that you corrected the behavior. That was the problem. So you could theoretically make very good grades in this course and do well and still get expelled from the program for bad behavior. Okay. I guess the moral of the story is it professionalism is what is expected of you when you enter the workforce. Professionalism is what's going to be expected of you in this course. We expect you to maintain a certain degree of honesty, uh, integrity, um, positive interactions with faculty, staff, me, the medical direction team, preceptors, co-workers while you're in rotations, etc. It's expected, and anything less is not acceptable. So please keep that in mind as you go through. Positive attitudes, even if you think that someone from here has written you an email that was shortened to the point and you thought it was rude, they probably didn't intend it that way, but you know, looking back, maybe it was too shortened to the point. Just be professional in your responses and understand that in their mind, it was, it was professional. And even if it wasn't professional, if someone accidentally said something that offended you, the best way to handle anything is it with a positive attitude. And usually that goes a long way to smoothing everything around with everyone. So just keep that in mind. Okay. It's important, again, to read that course access email thoroughly. Print it off. I told you what all is in it. Uh, but in that second page or attachment that came with it, it talks about the student announcements page for your course. And it may be several pages you have to read through. This is different than the EMT student announcements page if you took EMT from us. It's a different link. So be sure you're in the correct student announcements page for P1 AEMT Intermediate. What we put there is all ongoing announcements and updated policies because things are dynamic. We change our policy and procedure manual once a year, but sometimes things come up and we have to post things there. And if we tried to do it by email, we'd get barred by everyone for sending out bulk email thinking we're spammers. Sometimes people don't always join the list in a timely manner or they don't want to read back all the Yahoo posts to figure out if it pertains to them. So we keep a student announcements page as a centralized location that we can easily post and clean out for things that may impact you until you're finished with this course all the way through rotations. So it is very important that you go to that page, read everything there first, and then watch the latest posts no less than once a week to see if there's anything there that may affect you. RSVP deadline reminders I post there and exactly when and remind you where to email and by what time and date so that you can get into a skill session. Uh, links to the course are somewhere in this area. Clinical paperwork uh, links are in this area that you get all of your clinical paperwork and background check information, etc. that you need that will be discussed hopefully in a later video or at least go there and read the material until we get videos posted for that content. There's also usually another link for a Texas background check for certification that is separate from the criminal background check you must do for PERCOM as a student before you can go into rotations. Okay? Some people like to say, oh, I did this background check. You're going to have to take this one. We have no access to the Texas background check. It only gets released by the Texas Department of Public Safety to the Texas Department of State Health Services, who does not share that with any program. So you have to do both if you're going to rotations. There's also uh, going to be a place on those pages there for a uh, link for the chat room, which we'll discuss later, which is a mandatory part of your course. And as I said, every student has a responsibility to check this page at least weekly. 
or, and look at it every time you log into your course for new announcements. Okay, information posted on this page should be considered clarification or addition to the rules that you've already been given as needed to address ongoing issues and unless stated otherwise applies to everyone in the program if applicable. Don't forget when you're done with the course if you're still in clinicals that you still have to go here and check those announcements at least once a week. Okay? That'll keep you kind of on the straight and narrow and keep you from accidentally blundering into something you didn't mean to. All right. All courses have a weekly participation requirement. This is mandatory so we know you are still there. It is just like showing up for class. Only because we're online and sometimes some of us are in different cities that are teaching you or, or helping you through these programs, maybe even different countries. So we all don't see each other on a daily basis any more than we see you. So the only way around this is until you are done with all course requirements all the way through final exam and all the way through your final uh, rotations is that you must log in each week. Once a week. No longer. Once a week you have to show up for class. Now when you are still in didactic, the instructors will check that you're logging in and that you're doing coursework. Once you have finished final exam, they'll just check. The lead instructors will still be checking to see that you are logging in once a week and that you've not exceeded your course deadline. If you have done one of these things, they'll give you one warning. And then you're expected to maintain that or fix the deadline issue with me and then meet you know, any issues there or you'll be dropped from the course with no further warnings. We're not going to chase you because we feel like you must be professional enough to show up for class and to keep up with the requirements. Okay? Um, and like I said, this is our central location for roll call. So just remember, even when you're done with didactic, you still have to go in and log in and log out, and it makes an entry into our database that we can see exactly when, what time, etc., that you logged in and logged out. As I mentioned before, every course has a mandatory course deadline by which you must be successfully done with all skills, final exam, and for this course, the rotations if you wish to test for AEMT or EMT Advanced. Um, nine months is what you get. One of the other requirements is a scenario-based chat room, and you're required to participate in the scenario-based chat rooms, a minimum of three of them before you get done with P1. EMT chat is typically on Monday and Tuesday evenings at 7.30. I believe Tuesday evenings is more specifically for the P1 students. If you can't go on Tuesday evenings, you can go on Monday nights at 7.30 Texas time, but there's going to be questions that are directed toward P2 content as well, EKG strips, etc. So you might be better if you can put yourself in the Tuesday evening chats. 7 p.m., 7.30 p.m., I'm sorry, on, on uh, Texas time. Whatever Texas time is, 7.30. If you get there early or you get there and the EMT chat room is still going on, just wait patiently for it to finish and then you'll be able to join your chat room. Uh, participation is required. By participation, you can't just lurk. You must jump into the scenario, ask questions, answer questions that the instructor or Dr. Kiss or the other medical directors throw out there, and um, actually participate, or you may be required to go to more sessions than just three until you do. And you cannot graduate or finish P1 until this is done. Skills are required at one of our designated skill sites. We cannot approve outside instructors for one-on-one -on -one skills work with you, so don't ask. We don't know them, or even if we do know them, and then we they may be somebody that we've had experiences with in the past, or maybe we like them, but it would be very, very costly to set up labor-intensive. It may interfere with some of our existing sites, and we add them as we need them, but we won't add sites that are too close to one that is existing, and we will not add a site for just one student one time. These sites come on, and then they give us schedules for a year out of what they're available to do. Um, and so we use our trusted instructors that we hand select. So that's how that works. There are three P1 sessions, two P1 practice sessions, which are mirror images of each other, but you have to do both, and one P1 testing. Some students who are current doctors, RNs, uh, respiratory therapists, flight medics who are not paramedics yet, um, 68 Whiskey, 
Navy corpsmen, etc., may be exempted upon request from one or both practice sessions, but they have to submit appropriate documentation, make sure that they're comfortable with all the skills first, and then get in touch with me, and I might exempt them from one or both practice sessions. But for most students, you have to go to all three, and if you don't meet those criteria, don't try to get an exemption. Okay? If you're a expired paramedic, possibly. If you are anything else, a physical therapist, a, um, I would say a holistic medicine doctor, chiropractor, um, an EMT expired who was an EMT for years but never made it through paramedic school, those, none of those would be exempted from practice. I'm sorry. Okay? Um, you may, if you have IV skills, like you are a phlebotomist at your hospital, if you send me the proof of that, I may exempt you from the live sticks. That's about all you would be exempted from, but you'd still have to go to the sessions. Uh, and even if you're exempted from the practice sessions, you would still have to go to the PERCOM P1 skills testing at one of our designated sites and pass it, all the skills, on that first session. If you're exempted and you fail any of the skills, then you would be required to repeat the testing session and there is a rescheduling fee for that because we have to pay tuition for you to go again. And also possibly a second rescheduling fee if we feel it necessary for you to go to a practice session or even more if, it, if your performance was so, uh, I guess the only way I can say it, so bad that you have to have two practice sessions, you have to pay for those. Okay, so... Uh, make sure if you're waived that you're prepared for all skills when you get there. And make sure that you're familiar and competent in all those skills before you ask to be waived. One-on-one -on -one skills may be available around scheduled sessions, but costs more because we have to pay the instructors more. Um, most sites require a minimum of three students for it to make it financially feasible for them. So we have to give them more money to make it financially feasible for them to take off their jobs their part-time jobs, pay for equipment, etc., site use, whatever it is that they have to do. Um, so we would charge you for that. But we can do it if there none of the scheduled sessions meet your, your what you can do. Maybe you're coming in from out of state or out of the country. However, it's dependent upon instructor availability, and Abilene's usually the best chances I have of being able to schedule that. Usually you'd need to bring a helper with you for one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, if you're from out of state or out of the country, let us know. We'll try to fix that. But if you're from inside the state, you need to plan on bringing someone with you if you're paying for a one-on-one -on -one session. Um, that someone should be maybe an EMT, uh, another paramedic, and for this level, doesn't mind you sticking them with IV needles and blood draw needles because you have to stick someone. Um... I mentioned the rescheduling fees. If you're going, it doesn't matter any of the sessions. If your performance is so bad and you're not prepared, you may have to pay rescheduling fees. We'll talk about that more in a moment. Uh, RSVPs are required a minimum of three weeks ahead of the session. Instructions for RSVP are posted on the student announcements page. No late RSVPs are accepted, and you must uh, have been cleared by your lead instructor. Having completed everything, read everything, done everything through the pharmacology section of P1 to be eligible to go to any P1 skills, even if you're just going to testing. No exceptions. No late RSVPs will be accepted. And don't ask to go if you're not cleared. Once the session is locked and confirmed by me, cancellations typically will cause a no-show fee again, rescheduling fee. There are times when things happen, and I understand that. If something serious happens after you've been locked into a session, like a car accident, you get deployed, um, a close family member dies that you have to be there, as long as you can produce some evidence showing what has transpired, I'll send that to the instructor or the site and ask if they'd be willing to waive the fee. If they're willing to waive the fee, I'll waive the fee. But you have to be able to prove, provide some evidence of what's going on, and then I leave it up to the instructors or the site to make the decision. I won't make that decision. Skill sessions are at various sites, mostly in Texas, although we're adding in a site at, just outside of Dublin, Ireland in uh, 2014, in case you're interested. And uh, the skill sessions sites may change over time with additions or deletions. So look on the calendar on the student announcements page. Look for the words um, P1 practice or P1 testing session. 
Those are the sessions that would apply to you. Each session tells where the general location is by company or site name and instructor name if that's if it's just a, an individual instructor, but it'll have the city and state so that you can get a feel for what's out there. And then you can look three weeks back, the Friday three weeks back, to see when the RSVP deadline is, by which you have to be RSVP'd. Students must be prepared for the session before you go. To prepare doesn't mean you need to be good at the stuff. It just means you need to be familiar. You need to have memorized all of the skill sheets before you go to the first session. Memorize the skill sheets. Know them. Because the instructors are going to demo and then have you practice. They shouldn't have to be pulling out an airway going, this is an oral airway. That is not necessary. If you memorize the skill sheets, you've been working in the course, you can, most of the textbooks now have online resources, and it's talked about in most of the textbooks you get where you can go to get resources for that book, and that may include skills videos. Heck, even YouTube is useful in prepping for skill sessions because a lot of people post skills videos that help you learn how to do the skills. Just make sure that the skills video you're watching matches the skill sheet you have from Percom so you have a good idea of what to do. This will maximize your time in practice. Students who are obviously not prepared, which they know the instructors know they're going to have to tweak. They're going to have to help you. But if you come and you haven't memorized the skill sheets, it's going to be painfully obvious. If you come and you haven't done anything to prepare, and it's, it's obvious that you're not getting it on these skills, the instructors will most likely send you home and or contact me immediately and let me know what's going on. And you'll be sent home, or at the end of the session, you may be sent home but required to reschedule, pay a rescheduling fee, and go to another session. So that's how imperative it is that you are prepared. You don't have to be perfect. It's nice if you have a place you can practice your skills, but it's not required. But if you are not prepared, you cannot use those two days at a time effectively to get done with all of the practice and meet the skills competencies that you're going to be required to do. Students will receive a skills competency worksheet before you go to the session. If you don't get it, you need to email me before the session and say, hey, I didn't get it. And um, it has to be completed prior to completing all of your P1 skill sessions or you'll be required to schedule for another practice session and pay a rescheduling fee. It can be done, but it does put the onus on you as the student to ensure that you're getting through all the stations, you're getting plenty of hands-on practice on all of the skills listed in the competency sheets. So you need to work with your instructors before you go. And what you need to do is keep print off a copy of it, and then in the session, uh, if a peer watched you do a skill, whether you, you did it successfully or unsuccessfully, you make little hash marks in the columns. The instructor watched you make little hash marks. At the end of the session, the instructor needs to verify, yeah, I remember that, yeah, 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 and they'll tally it all up and then send it to me. Then I will calculate all the percentages and send it back to you in a color copy so that you can see what you still need to do at the next session or at the testing session if you're at that point. And you will need to, um, you will need to do that and ensure that you get everything done. Um, and the easiest way to do that is before you go to the second or the third session, print off the new version in color and take it with you. Don't use the same one you've already been using. That gets too confusing. Okay? If you are exempted from practice sessions, you won't have to do the competency worksheet at this level. You will have to do the competency worksheet at paramedic level. Okay? Um, it is your responsibility to utilize the time and equipment available and work with the instructors and your peers to ensure plenty of hands-on opportunities and to keep track of all those successful and unsuccessful attempts and who saw you do it. So, all right. Clinical paperwork is posted somewhere on the student announcements pages under buttons, uh, links, etc. We're in the process of changing our web page and uh, we'll see that. But... It must be submitted in its entirety as soon as possible after you get in this course if you want to avoid delays in starting your rotations after being skills cleared. Usually at the end of your first practice session if you did well on all skills or if you're waived after you pass your testing session. 
The clearance is involved in making sure you've done all the skills at least to a level that the instructor is comfortable releasing you for precepted practice and rotations. And one of the forms that you'll receive that needs to be signed off for that if the instructor approves is an instructor entry level proficiency form. And if that instructor signs that, then you can start rotations as soon as you can get them scheduled through clinicals after that session. But the sooner you get your clinical paperwork in, the sooner you can get your rotation started. The only piece of paperwork that has a, a window that's really close is the 10 panel urine drug screen, which must be done within 30 days of your first rotation. So get everything else in and checked in with either Mr. Allman or Mr. Reuter, whoever is checking you in, and tell them when you're planning on doing your drug screen and tell them when you'd like to start rotations and start getting the dates worked out and then ensure that that drug screen gets there right there at that 30-day window or else you won't be able to go to rotations. That's also why it's so important. Um, that 30-day window is very important in, in scheduling for all rotations. You cannot send dates to the clinical people that is less than 30 days and expect to get a rotation schedule. It's a process. They have to contact the sites. The sites usually require that they contact by email. So they email the sites and they wait. And then if they haven't heard back in several days, then they email a second time. And then if they still hadn't heard back, then they'll try to call someone. But it's not unusual for sites to change staff who are the ones supposed to be the coordination people for them to go on vacation, be off on sick leave, and have nobody there answering those emails. And they do not tell the schools when this happens. We only find out when we've tried and tried and cannot get any answers. And then finally, we figure out that, hey, that person changed or they changed their entire email system and you've been emailing the wrong system. Um, so you need to give plenty of time and understand that it takes time to schedule these rotations. It's not going to be quick or easy. And understand that they don't. the, the clinical staff do not sit on your requests. When they get them in... If they get them in on a Friday, it's usually early the next week when they do it. They're not going to do it over the weekend. But they will get to it as soon as they do it in the order they've received it in the emails. And usually within two or three days, then they'll start trying to get you scheduled. But they have no control over how long it takes for those sites to respond. They police it. They work it. But they can't make demands. So please be patient. If you've requested something and it gets close to the time and you've given plenty of notice, at least 30 days notice, and it's getting close to that time, then contact Mr. Reuter and ask him by email. Okay? Um, final process for course completion. The requirements to complete your course at P1 and either be able to move on to P2 or to be eligible to take the AEMT exam. You must have completed all of the didactic work successfully and turned it in. You must take and pass the final exam. You must receive positive marks on your effective behavior evals and pass those evals or have significant improvement if you got a bad eval with counseling. Then you must have some post-counseling evaluations for your affective behavior showing that things have improved and things are better. Um, you must take and pass the skill sessions, all skills testing, the scenario testing involved, and all skills individual testing. You must have an entry-level instructor proficiency form signed. If you were waived from skills practice, that needs to be signed at the end of the skills testing session. And then that needs, I put that in the file. And for those of you who are not waived, you also have to have a completed skills competency worksheet with everything turned to 100%. Or you get to go to another session at your expense until it's done. So... All of that is necessary. And again, it is not necessary to take and pass the final exam prior to going to skills. You must also, if you're planning on testing at NREMT Advanced, AEMT, as we talked about earlier, complete all your rotation requirements. Submit all the paperwork the ways that you were told when you signed up, that you follow all the rules, you've submitted all the paperwork correctly, it's been checked in and graded as correct, everything's there, the spreadsheet is completed, all of your things are marked completed by clinicals. And then that will be sent to me. And once all of that is in place, and I'm notified by the clinical coordinator, and for this level, it's, it's usually um, helpful if you will send me an email if you're planning on testing at AEMT saying, hey, I'm done. 
I would like to test for AMT, that prompts me to make sure that all your stuff is started and in the process. Once it gets there, I have our secretary organizes, make sure your file is complete. She pulls together all of the paperwork that Dr. Kiss will need to review to approve your graduation and sends it to me. I double check it, then I forward it on to Dr. Kiss. Dr. Kiss then reviews all the paperwork. It may take him a few days. He is a busy man. He works full time in an emergency room. He works full time as uh, the Harris County Emergency Corps Medical Director. And he's also on the Harris County SWAT team as their medical director and as a police officer. So sometimes it takes him a few days to get the signed form back to me. But as long as you have set up your National Registry account properly, and as long as you have applied for the AEMT exam, and in that application you have marked in the drop-down menu of what program you're graduating from, PERCOM, Professional Education and Resources Company, however it's listed, then it'll show up in my account. And as soon as I get the email with the form back from Dr. Kiss, I'll open up the National Registry account, sign in, find your name, clear you, send you an email saying you're cleared. And then I send the form back to my secretary who finishes your file, processes as a course completion certificate and a letter with some instructions. I check it, sign it, and then she will email that to you. When you typically use email, you can print it off on your end. If you require an actual printed copy, you'll just need to let us know and where to send it so that we can get it sent to you. Um, this process can take up to two weeks, but typically it's less, especially if your National Registry application and account is set up so that I can go in and mark, it, mark you clear. So we hope that this helps and that you enjoy the course. Remember again that positive interaction with your instructors, clinical staff, preceptors, me, medical directors, etc. will help you sail through the program smoothly. Sometimes misunderstandings can occur because you can't hear an email. You can't see facial expressions. You can't hear voice inflections. And sometimes what someone types is not what they intended for it to sound. But when you're the one who's typing it, you may not realize that at first. So be positive, talk, communicate with all concerned, and things will be fine. Try not to jump to conclusions. Talk to the people. And if you talk and can't get anywhere, then you can bring me in on it. Um, we hope that you have a good time in the course and that you learn, and we hope to see you soon, and we hope to see you out on the streets. Thank you. Bye-bye.